Now joining us on Book TV is author Richard Miniter. Mr. Miniter, what do you write about? I write about things that interest me and I hope they interest other people. This latest book is called Eyes on Target. It's about the Navy SEALs, but it's a little bit different. It's about the culture of the Navy SEALs, what makes them different, unique people. I mean, the, US, the United States Navy has spent millions of dollars trying to discover what it may, how, to, how a Navy SEAL is made. You know, what, what makes some people succeed, go through basic training, and what makes 70% of people fail? And they looked for demographics, they looked at ethnicity, they looked at family background, they looked at religion, and they found that none of that mattered. Some of the most successful Navy SEALs grew up in wealthy suburban homes, and some of the real standout Navy SEALs grew up on food stamps and public housing. Some are white, some of the most distinguished are black, including J.J. Johnson, who now runs uh, Homeland Security for Texas, but for many years was a Navy SEAL. Some are Hispanic, some are Asian, some are native-born, many are foreign-born. And in this book, I have a story first ever told of Dragos, born in, uh, and imprisoned in, co in communist Poland and grew up in that struggle. So they come from all walks of life, all economic backgrounds, all faiths, uh, and they can't find the common denominator except for one thing, they never quit. What makes a SEAL get through all of these levels of training and makes them a real standout in combat is they're able to do three things at the same time, which no one else can really do. They dominate their bodies. They're able to control their bodies and fight physical exhaustion. And Hell Week is one of the things they do in basic underwater demolition school that really forces them to be able to do that. They go almost a week without sleep. Secondly, to dominate your mind, you must fight confusion. You must fight fear. And this, when, when there's great physical fatigue and when there's great mental fatigue, your mind gets worn out too. The ability to persevere through that mental fog is another test. And thirdly, to dominate your spirit, to drive your will, to constantly go forward. To be able to do those three things at the same time. There are, there are individuals who can do one or the other uh, or the third one. But to be able to do all three is really extraordinary. And this culture that creates that this unique people is under threat as our politically correct defense department begins to change what is culturally allowed among this unique set of commandos is changing as well. And that that was interesting to me. So that's why I wrote this book. Are there women in the SEALs? Not yet, although uh, the, the defense department is certainly looking at this. Uh, there are former SEALs who have um, had sex change operations. So some would say that there are women now. Uh, but, you know, SEALs are unusual outliers. I mean, not everyone can be a SEAL. In fact, very few people can. It's an extraordinary thing. Whether there's a lot of debate within the community, within the SEAL community, about women, whether women can physically do it. I talked to a U.S. Army Ranger instructor, He's someone who trains Rangers, and Rangers are a very demanding physical program as well. And he pointed out the case of an Olympic athlete, a woman Olympic athlete, who couldn't get through Ranger training. Uh, and, you know, there are male Olympic athletes who fail to get through SEAL training. So the question is whether or not you can maintain the same standards and have women. And that, that sounds like a political question, but for the Navy SEALs involved, it's really a practical and physical one. Can you, you know, do the push-ups? Can you carry the heavy loads? Can you physically endure for, you know, 140 hours? Can you carry those heavy logs? You know, can you physically do the job? Because you're... The SEALs are operating in some of those demanding environments on Earth. There are SEAL operations where they're dropped from 40,000 feet, uh, that's you know, eight miles high, uh, into a cold ocean, 10 miles offshore, where they're swimming underwater. One of the missions we talk about in this book, they're literally swimming with sharks in the Philippines, uh, swimming in the cold waters of the Pacific uh, to set up uh, surveillance beacons. Uh, they're operating at high altitudes, 11, 12,000 feet, in the, um, in the mountains of Afghanistan and other places. So that it takes a great deal of physical endurance. How many Navy SEALs are there? How many try out? The exact number is, is classified, uh, but it's roughly about 2,000 Navy SEALs worldwide, uh, and then it's an alumni organization of a few thousand more. Um, at some point, I think every boy thinks about, and many girls I'm sure do too, think about being a Navy SEAL. But those who actually get to try out for BUDS is about 10,000 over the course of the last 10 years. So to even get to the point where you're able to, to go to basic underwater demolition school, which they call BUDS, which is basic training for SEALs, uh, is a demanding process by itself. It used to be that you had to join the Navy 
and go through Navy basic training. Now you can join the Navy and get selected for SEAL training directly. But even after you get through BUDS, there's SQT, which is another demanding uh, training program. So it takes about a year and a half to two years of grueling selection process to get through that program. And very few do. Uh, less than 20% in most classes make it through the program. And these are highly selected, highly fit, young people with demonstrated capabilities. Some of the Annapolis grads, um, former Marines, Olympic athletes, all these people fail. How long does one stay in the SEALs? That's a great question. Uh, you think it's a young man's game, but I, I met a great number of SEALs who are still in active duty who are in their mid to late 30s. Uh, often, you know, they want to do about 20 years to get the pension. One of the things I've discovered in writing Eyes on Target, though, is there's a record number of early retirements, people leaving after 16 years or after 12 years, and that's because they sense that it's becoming more politically correct. There are uh, Al-Qaeda prisoners who have pressed charges, which turned out to be false, and they were SEALs were later exonerated at trial, uh, but the trials went on for a year and a half before they were exonerated, and, and once they were found not guilty, I mean, this was a case which the SEAL Team 10 captured uh, the Al-Qaeda leader at Fallujah, who's responsible for hanging those four American bodies off the bridge at Fallujah, that infamous atrocity that was seen around the world, the cameras feasted on it. Five years later, the SEAL Team 10 captured the guy behind it. It was a flawless operation. They turned him in without firing a shot. And it's full, it reads like a thriller, this chapter on, on how they caught him. Uh, but the guy behind it, Carl Higby, was woken up about four hours after the capture and says, you're in big trouble. He said, why? The prisoner has a bloody lip. And that led to a year and a half of legal charges of abuse of a prisoner. The SEALs were later exonerated. Many of those men decided, you know, after they've been subjected to this degree of legal scrutiny, they just want, didn't want to sign up for another tour. And the taxpayers lost millions of dollars of training investment in each of these men. This is something we really need to think about, is yes, we need to protect the rights, of, human rights of prisoners. We also have to realize that the Al-Qaeda in manuals that they've, we've captured in the Somali plains of Afghanistan and other places, trains people to make false reports in order to tie up our military and red tape and keep our war fighters off the field. We have to be aware that sometimes the, mil the, the enemy will make false reports on purpose, not in good faith. And we have to protect the SEALs and other special operators from that or they'll spend all their time in court and not enough time protecting our fellow Americans from some of the deadliest people on earth, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. What kind of access were you granted officially to write Eyes on the I Target? I got a fair amount of very good access uh, to uh, current and retired SEALs, uh, some of whom are not named in the book. But I, I think, you know, both my co-author, Scott McEwen, uh, who co-wrote American Sniper about Chris Kyle, the deadliest SEAL sniper, uh, we both had a fair amount of uh, access to interesting people. Why do we hear so much about SEAL Team 6? Well, should we be hearing so much about SEAL Team 6? One of the things the SEALs complain about is that they're becoming famous. And they thought it was a mistake for Vice President Biden to name them as the executioners of Osama bin Laden. Uh, they thought it'd be better if it seemed like a bolt from the blue uh, than to name that uh, yet unit. And when there was an attack on SEAL Team 6 about 90 days after bin Laden's death, uh, shooting down a helicopter called Extortion 17, which led to the single greatest loss of life for Navy SEALs in their history since D-Day. Uh, they thought that was retaliation by Al-Qaeda for, uh, for them killing Osama bin Laden. So naming them, they think, put their lives at risk and the lives of their families at risk. And we know from intelligence documents, and this is in the book, that Al-Qaeda has an, uh, as an online unit that looks through social media, especially Facebook, to find the identities of SEALs and their families. SEAL is an acronym for? Uh, sea, uh, sea, air, and land, basically. Uh, it's, uh, it, was, it was a term developed in the Kennedy years. Before that, they were the fraud men of the underwater demolition teams. Uh, they snuck into enemy harbors and put bombs on the bottoms of boats uh, and cleared uh, obstacles for submarines during World War II. That was the UDT. Uh, SEALs came about in the early 1960s uh, through Kennedy. Kennedy, of course, JFK had uh, been on the a skipper of the PT-109, and he understood the ability of a, a small boat uh, and a small crew of, of Navy personnel, what a big difference they could make in combat, especially in the Pacific. So he pushed for 